Have you ever wondered how we keep our gear and equipment in the fight for the long haul? About 25 years ago, the Marine Corps established the Corrosion Prevention and Control Program to extend the useful life of all Marine Corps tactical ground and ground support equipment. From bolts to vehicles, CPAC is attacking the Corps' corrosion problem with fervor. Today, I'm excited to have Eric Brown, the product manager for the CPAC program, located in our logistic combat element system portfolio on the podcast. Welcome, Eric. Hey, Trip. Glad to be here. Well, it's going to be awesome. I'm looking forward to this conversation. So uh, before we get down to the nitty gritty of CPAC, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, Trip, I'm originally from upstate New York or the Rust Belt uh, from Rochester. Okay. And uh, so I'm very uh, familiar and intimate with corrosion and its effects and its consequences. So upstate New York, how did you end up at CISCOM and, and then in CPAC? So after, after leaving the Marine Corps, uh, I joined industry uh, for eight years, and then one of my, my last job was actually at General Dynamics Land Systems, or worked on the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle. Okay. And then from there, I transferred over on the government side, uh, eventually became uh, PEO Land Systems. Okay, so you said you were a Marine. What did you do in the Marine Corps? I was a uh, 6493, which I fixed weather equipment. Fixed weather equipment. Weather equipment technician. That's okay. the simple terms. So then talk to us, what is corrosion prevention and control? So corrosion prevention and control, what we do is our primary mission is to extend the useful life of Marine Corps uh, ground equipment. That, that is the ultimate goal for, for CPAC. Okay. And what methods do we use for that? So we've got the five pillars or four pillars of CPAC. One is we do assessments on equipment. The next one is engineering. And then we've got a corrosion uh, prevention through our corrosion service teams. And then we got found we've got corrosion repair through our corrosion repair facilities. So I, if there's any boaters in the crowd, I think when you're, if you're a boater, you'll quite often put uh, what is a zinc component on the bottom of the ship that's uh, intended to be uh, sacrificial so that the zinc will corrode and everything else right. won't. Right. And we, we've, we've done that. We've actually called what's called zinc-rich primers okay. uh, that, we've, that we put on, that we recommend putting on that, that steel during, during co the coating process. So what then are some of your team's key objectives for the Marine Corps? Key objectives right now is, again, those four pillars, right? Assessments. What we do is assess all those. We've got five corrosion categories that our, our corrosion service teams go out there and assess each piece of equipment, determine what kind of category it is, and that determines the level of maintenance that's required uh, for, for corrosion on that equipment. Uh, we are always looking for the next best thing in corrosion prevention, uh, whether that's a material, or whether that's a coating, whether it's a lubricant, what is that? And also our engineers support all the program offices here at, at the PEO and also at Marine Corps Systems Command uh, to, to try to uh, engineer in prevention before that equipment gets fielded. So roughly how many people are we talking about? Well, the whole, the whole CPAC team to acquire support contractors, CFT, CRS, we're talking about 250 people. That's, uh, so that's enormous. That's way more than I was expecting. 250 people, awesome. And do you travel around a lot, go to Hawaii, California, Yes, Trip. We, we've got operations in Camp Lejeune. Both we have a corrosion repair facility there, which is which we are partnered with the Marine Depot Maintenance Command uh, to operate those facilities. I've also got corrosion service teams at Camp Lejeune. Same thing with Camp Pendleton. Corrosion service teams, Hawaii, got a CRF there and a corrosion service team, and also Okinawa, Japan. Okay. What about Mar 4 Res? Do you run around? Uh... I've got a mobile team that, uh, that does service Mar 4 Res okay. equipment. How does CPAC increase the Marine Corps' readiness and lethality? So we always struggle with that. A is, you know, we prevent, try to prevent corrosion. Again, we want to extend the useful life. But it has, that also has a side effect as far as readiness. So we, when our corrosion service teams get out there and they service that equipment by putting corrosion preventive compounds uh, of various types on the equipment, basically what that does is help, help keep that equipment ready to go. And also it reduces any kind of maintenance time that if that vehicle needs, you need some kind of a maintenance, you could actually take equipment on and off very easily instead of battling with corrosion, let's say rusted brake lines or other corroded pieces or breaking off bolts, you're not doing that. You're getting in to maintain it and you're getting out. Corrosion shouldn't be a factor. When I think of the other services, you know, the Navy, of course, deals with the salt environment that, that we do. The Army, my impression is, doesn't think about it so much, but a lot of the equipment that we get comes from the Army. They're the peak for a lot of things we buy. So do, have they done much in the way of corrosion prevention, or do we have to add that on when we get Army gear? The Army does not really pay attention close to corrosion as far as getting it in early uh, in the engineering process than the Marine Corps does. The Marine Corps is actually, in my opinion, I may be biased, but we are the, the tip of the spear when it comes to ground equipment support. Okay. Uh, CPAC, what makes us unique is that we are a centrally managed program from here, from, from CISCOM, uh, which helps us introduce 
and actually uh, dictate policy and get new stuff out there that's spread across the Marine Corps versus the Army, which is more segregated and, and isolated in, in different, uh, different topic areas for, for their equipment. Same thing with the Navy. Any climb or place. We use the phrase a lot. Obviously, a lot of times, as I just mentioned, you know, the climb or place is going to involve uh, salt water. Are there different corrosion considerations to take depending upon the Marine Corps' operational environment? Cold, warm, etc.? Yeah, you bet. The, the, the corrosion, obviously the Muse, uh, there we service equipment on the Muse before and after they go on a Muse deployment because they are exposed. A lot of the equipment is its life is on ship or out in the Pacific somewhere. Each service area, like Hawaii, Camp Pendleton, they've got a different corrosion service intervals, right? Hawaii's got a nine-month ser- inter- service interval, and Camp Pendleton has a 12-month service interval, for example. And so we service that equipment depending on where its corrosive environment is. And we've got, uh, to include MAR-4 Res equipment, over 100 different locations with different service intervals uh, because of that environment that they're in. So do you see a difference in corrosion overall with East Coast Mews versus Pacific Mews? All we do, the East Coast, actually uh, in uh, Camp Lejeune, that's a 12-month service interval, for example. And then the, but again, saltwater, saltwater. But since we're doing a lot of operations in the Pacific, we see a lot more corrosion uh, in those in those areas. Same thing with with uh, the equipment that's in Okinawa, Japan, okay. another highly corrosive area. All right. Can you share with us some examples of specific capabilities and technologies employed by CPAC to prevent and mitigate corrosion? So the CPAC team, our CSTs are really the, the those are those are the front lines of this war on corrosion uh, that we've got. Our corrosion service teams are outfitted with we've got trailers that have all the corrosion prevention compounds. We've got air compressors. We've got tools to do uh, small amounts of surface prep and touch up on some areas that are that need that need new coating repair. Uh, we've also just recently fielded this year our enhanced corrosion service team uh, capability, which is another trailer that actually we could do an extensive and extended paint operation, corrosion, some cor- coating repair, and a lot more surface area of that uh, of that piece of equipment than we can do for normal surface prep and touch up. The technology that you apply. Are they on every portfolio of equipment that we have here at the command and the PEO? Or do, do you, I mean, I, I can well imagine vehicles, for example, but what about radios, rifles, stuff like that? We don't do radios or rifles or electronics. Uh, mostly it's all the ground equipment. You're talking, you know, all, obviously all the vehicles, trailers, uh, generators, uh, water purification systems, all your engineering systems, bulldozers, uh, any heavy equipment. A lot of those things, water water bowls, anything that's out on a lot that you see that's either desert tan or or green, we service those. So the larger items, larger I guess, items. in my mind. Okay. And we even get into some uh, aviation assets, depending on where we go uh, for, for those. Oh, so Nav Air, the Marine Corps side of Nav Air comes over. And so, some, some, some of their ground equipment. Oh, for yeah, their ground for, equipment. For the wing. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what exactly are some of the challenges that are faced in maintaining corrosion prevention efforts? So right now, our biggest challenge, uh, obviously, is uh, you know resources. Uh, I used to have two Mar 4 Res teams going, traveling teams that go around to service the Mar 4 Res. Now we're down to one. So obviously, there's some of those site, so service intervals may end up being like over over two years, or they need certain. So and also TCOM, we're trying to get a lot into the training and education command equipment, servicing that equipment at the service interval that's required for those. That that remains to be a challenge. And also here at the command, trying to get more awareness of corrosion uh, and what the CPAC program can do for all these other programs. We do uh, have an engagement uh, system going on. We've, that, that was our big hit last year. Uh, we've increased those engagements of each of the programs uh, to provide corrosion engineering services for that program. To help those programs identify requirements for corrosion prevention early, especially pre-milestone B equipment, or we could get those requirements in for the coatings, for the materials, and other things needed to engineer in corrosion prevention so it avoids that equipment getting into a corrosion repair facility or depot within five years of fielding. I mean, that's standard systems engineering. Plan for it up front and early. It is. Right? Uh, but a lot of, the, again, corrosion, it, it's one of those topics that's uh, boring but very important. So, and a lot of these programs, you know, get, getting, you know, they're, they're focused on getting a missile to launch. They're focused on getting a truck to go forward. You know, move, shoot, carry, communicate, and carry, and protect. Those are the big functions they're worried about. Corrosion is kind of not on the on the skyline for them. It is for us. So I'm I'm trying to get out to the programs. Hey, let us be your engineering representatives to do that work for you, so we can make sure we get in those requirements, get in that those solutions early in the acquisition lifecycle, so that way we could you know 
again, prevention is, is key here. So when it comes to uh, your support of the Marines out in the fleet, what kind of a feedback do you get from them and, and how does that help you be able to support them better in the next cycle? That starts with our corrosion service teams. So before they go to each unit, we have a field service representative that'll go to that unit. We'll have an in-brief with that unit. And then to kind of say, hey, here's a corrosion service team. We're here to service equipment. A lot of them already know what it's about, but as we know, Marines rotate. Uh, so we do an in-brief, tell them exactly what we're going to do, how we're going to do it, and when we're going to do it, and how long it's going to take. Uh, then at the end of the service, we do an out-brief. And we say, hey, here's, what we, here's our findings. Here's what we got. Uh, so at that time, we collect any kind of feedback uh, from, from those Marine units, the FSRs report it back to me. Uh, same thing with our, our, our mobile corrosion service team for the MAR-4 Res. Uh, they ask the, the units to fill out surveys. I get those surveys. Okay. Uh, I get surveys that, that, that most of all the time, they're, they're excellent. They, they love Or it could be, if it's anything negative, it's something very trivial, like a miscommunication. Overall, the CPAC team does, does a great job. We've gotten good reviews. The units do appreciate uh, what we do. We work with each of the MEFs at, at, the, at the G4 level as far as coordinating uh, some of the equipment going to our corrosion repair facilities and other matters dealing with corrosion. So we've got a really good relationship uh, with them as well. So we're really embedded uh, with, with the Marines at each of the MEFs. Okay. So we talk a lot uh, here at the command, but certainly on the podcast, about Force Design 2030. Uh, I know that with, uh, with the pivot to the Pacific, we're – looking at dealing, we are the Marine Corps, but we are looking at maybe even more more waterborne ops than before, more exposure to, to a saltwater environment. So how does your program, how are you contributing to that, especially with enhancing combat effectiveness and our operational readiness overall? So what we did with Force Design 2030, when that came out, we automatically started, we stopped servicing that equipment that was on the divestment list. Okay. Uh, we put them on what we call do not service list. That way, it pro provides us focus to focus on that equipment uh, that's going to be around for Force Design 2030s. And even some of that newer equipment like Nemesis, Long Range Fires, uh, LRUSV, some of that equipment, we turned our focus onto that, freed up resources uh, from, that old, from the old equipment to, to the new stuff. So day one, you're like, tanks, you're on your own. Tanks, you're on your own. Yep. <laughs> God, exactly. Good to go. As you know, we're in a rapidly changing landscape of technology and operational requirements. With that in mind, how do you foresee CPAC evolving in the coming years? So one of the big benefits of CPAC is we service the equipment at the unit's lot. They love that. We bring our trailers. we got our logo. They, they see us. They're, they're all in. They, they, they let us go do what you need to do, and we do a really good job of servicing that equipment. I want to try to do more at the unit's lot, uh, especially the repair uh, we've again, like I said before, we instituted our, our we had a new equipment capabilities for our enhanced corrosion service team to do more surface prep, surface prep and touch up operations on that equipment. I want to try to get into more of the repair, and I'm talking like sheet metal repair, uh, metal repair on some of those severely corroded pieces of equipment we could do at the units a lot instead of sending it to a corrosion repair facility, or if it has to go to a depot, we could do a lot of that prevention up front on the units a lot. So as you know, I'm, I'm the command safety guy, so I need to ask, how do safety and corrosion interact? Again, what CPAC does and what is very helpful is we keep the equipment operational uh, from, a, from, from a corrosion standpoint. So all those you know, hinges that don't rust up, any of those uh, brake lines that won't rust up, that has a, a side effect of improving safety. You know, when the equipment is fully operational and it does what it's supposed to do, it could prevent some, even some of the smallest of mishaps. How does CPAC integrate with other sustainability and environmental initiatives within the core? So we're very conscious, uh, the CPAC team is, of, of the environment. And we have tools, all our, when we do surface prep and touch up, or we're sanding or grinding on, on some equipment, we've got HEPA air filters that mm -hmm. clean that air. And a lot of the stuff is due to local regulation as well. Uh, we also recently, last year, we instituted the stainless steel grit in our blast facility at, in Okinawa, Japan. We were dumping quite a, quite a bit of, of uh, blast, you know, garnet, stone media, uh, as it, it turns into hazmat. Every year, that, that we're talking tons of hazmat disposal. Well, we reduced that disposal by switching over to stainless steel grit for, as a blast media. Okay. Uh, we reduced that hazmat by over 90%. So we're getting more life, even though the stainless steel may be more expensive, but we're getting a longer life out of that steel. It's more reusable. Reusable, reducing the hazmat a disposal uh, costs on that. And also it's got a lot of side effects as far as uh, it, it doesn't create a lot of dust. Uh, that, that When blasted garnet, when it pulverizes, it, it, it breaks down into dust, uh, where the stainless steel grit does not do that. So when we talk environmental and, and the safety side of CPAC, talk to me about hex chrome, because I know that... Uh, in my world, 
uh, you know, we've been talking about phasing out hex chrome for years. So how are we doing with that? So with hex chrome, again, with it with CPAC policy procedures, uh, we're aware of the equipment that may have that because we won't we won't touch that that kind of uh, equipment if it does have hex chrome or any kind of you know uh, bad compounds or bad coatings on it that we shouldn't be servicing. Lead is another example. Okay. Uh, some of these sometimes we get uh, requests for painting some of the trophy equipment that's out there that some of these units have and. We go out there and test. It's like, wait a minute, somebody painted this with a lead-based paint. In the 50s or something, yeah, they painted and, with lead-based paint. So we, we can't touch that. That's, that takes a little bit That's a little bit more costly. It takes more precautions, and that's just something that CPAC just doesn't do. Uh, again, our focus is on the operational forces, servicing that equipment, but we do have contract capability to help a, a unit. They want to contract that out to another organization to do that kind of. How do you uh, work with our sister services? We talked a little bit about the Navy earlier and the Army Delve into that a little bit more. Air Force, Space Force, Coast Guard. Yeah, we're not up in outer space yet, but uh, but that 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 could soon. Be, that soon that could be a goal. When the Marine Corps gets in outer space, maybe CPAC will be in outer space. Okay. But uh, at this time, we're we're, st- we're stuck to the ground and and, and uh, servicing the ground equipment. Uh, as far as the Army and the Navy are concerned, yes, we do service their equipment. We're, we've got a big relationship out in Okinawa, Japan, since we've got the I believe the only operational corrosion repair facility at that location, and also an operational corrosion service team. We service uh, Navy assets that are out there and okay. along with Army assets. We're working closely with those units uh, to, to service their equipment. Is corrosion a problem in space? Corrosion is basically oxidation. There's no oxygen in space. It, exactly. So, but, okay, all right. Uh, all right. There, there could be other forms of corrosion, but uh, but yeah. All right. Well, that sounds like uh, a, a geek side of the corrosion yeah, business that I'm not up on. We're, so. we're not there yet. All right, soon. Hey, you could, you could use that as your opportunity to get to Mars if uh, they need a corrosion person on the exactly the I'll, I'll put that in the next palm cycle right. okay so what about our allies do we have interest from our allies are they ahead of us behind us on, on this technology yeah certainly they, they come to us so right now with such we're, we're in okinawa japan we have trained our corrosion service teams have trained the the japanese self-defense uh, ground forces out there at that location on corrosion prevention techniques right. and and also some of our compounds and chemicals that we use also we've got a ro- rotational forces in darwin australia and we've been working with them as well, the Australians, uh, on how to service and, and uh, assess and repair accordance, in accordance with CPAC guidelines, uh, the equipment out there. Okay. Europeans? Uh, not yet. Then I'm more of not my, not my time, but we're, 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 getting, uh, we're getting out there. Okay. What about industry? Is industry ahead of us? What, what would you like to see out of industry to help your mission? So we've got some industry engagements. Uh, we're, we're, we're partnered with some of the key. Again, corrosion is a very niche market out there, so there's not a whole lot. Uh, but we are constantly uh, evaluating different corrosion preventive compounds and industry uh, puts out there. So we want to make sure we want to avoid the snake oil, right? Okay. So, so we, we've got processes that our engineers filter out as far as, hey, is this something that's useful for the Marine Corps or not? But we stay in touch with industry as far as what's the next best thing. And, and some of the stuff that, again, uh, with our engineers and, and our industry partners, uh, we try to really innovate, you know, getting, getting new tools out there. We've got some tools. We're always looking for the next best thing to make us quicker, faster, and, again, to service that equipment on the, on the unit's lot uh, that would go a long way uh, towards, again, stays in a lot, it's serviced, that increases your revenues. Yeah, the convenience to them, that, that factor has got to be huge it's in their huge. minds, right? So if we could develop a tool, like right now we're going through, it's, it's uh, dip, you know, with our uh, enhanced corrosion service team, uh, we've got a mini blast system. It's pretty big, it's bulky, it's heavy, and it really specializes in large flat surface areas, but we're trying to develop a tool, and we'll look at what industry has, what's commercial off the shelf, or what can we modify, uh, and taking advantage with stuff here to command, like the additive, uh, additive manufacturing okay. concepts, like... I've got partnership with them that, hey, if we come up with a tool, hey, says that, because we're not talking large quantities. I've got, you know, maybe 10 teams uh, that I may need to give this tool out to, and, and, and we'll buy it. So we'll make it to make us more efficient. Well, when I think of other technologies, I've seen these videos with uh, where lasers are used to, uh, to get rid of the corrosion. So you're talking about laser ablation. Okay. So we're getting into laser, and that, that's interesting. You see a lot of cool YouTube videos, right. uh, but what you don't see is a very large power supply okay. you know, behind it. So, but we're looking at that the technology is evolving. And we're, we're looking at that as well, say, what, what does that do? What can, what, could, what can CPAC take advantage of that technology at either at, from a corrosion service team or maybe at, at a corrosion repair facility? So does that make it less portable, the need for the large power supply? It would make it less, por- port- less portable. And, of course, again, we're talking different power voltages that, that may not be compatible uh, for a particular area that we're in. Especially, right, in an expeditionary environment, I can imagine that's less available. 
let's talk kudos. Your team was recently awarded the Excellence in Logistics and Product Support Team Award. Tell us a little bit more about this and what are some other CPAC success stories? Yeah, so the CPAC team is great. Great bunch of folks working, uh, especially up here at the program office and uh, elsewhere around the world. Uh, we did a lot last year. Uh, we serviced and assessed over 56,000 pieces of equipment. We got uh, over 4,000 pieces of equipment repaired at our corrosion repair facilities. Uh, we've also increased our program office engagements uh, with over, over 14 programs that we're working with providing various levels of engineering support in, in, a, in their life cycle of that particular piece of equipment. So we're making a difference, again, like I talked about early on on that. We've also the implementation of the stainless steel grit in Okinawa, Japan. That, that was a, a big hit there. And also the, the getting the design finalized for our enhanced corrosion service team, uh, the new trailer for that that we're going to be fielding in Camp Pendleton, California. I look forward to tracking the successes on those. What do you what do you think beyond that? What's next for CPAC? What I'm trying to do is is again here at the command is help out those program offices uh, with with their corrosion requirements, and it's getting stuff into like say can we get something into the mag you know requirements kind of like like cyber is one of those requirements safety. Well, corrosion ought to be up there along with those. We have no KPP for you know, safety. You know, so we, we need we need to uh, get that word out there and, again, help those programs at least come up with a boilerplate requirements for corrosion that will help out. So that will be our next step there is getting 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 our voice heard, getting getting louder uh, as far as, hey, we want to help you. Uh, let us take on that burden uh, so that way they can focus on their other KPPs that are, that are important to them. So I hesitate to ask because you sound very motivated to be doing corrosion prevention. Go ahead. Yeah, I am. I mean, it, it's uh, you know, I've worked on the uh, expeditionary fighting vehicle. I mean, you, you can't beat that. A track amphibious vehicle that go twenty knots. I got my seat card to operator on that, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, I was on the Nemesis program. Nothing like launching a, a, an anti ship missile uh, off a JLTV platform. So I've done some cool things. And then a lot of people says, "Now you're doing rust," you know. So, but I'm very passionate about. It. Again, I'm growing up from upstate New York. Mm -hmm. I know the consequences, the implications of having rusted equipment. It's not fun. And being a maintainer myself, a maintainer background. It is not fun working on rusted equipment. So if I could help prevent that, and again, we're doing uh, what's unique about the CPAC program is we're actually out in operations. You know, we got operations going on almost 24-7 uh, based on you know, uh, our worldwide service that we provide. And we want right. to do more, and we can do more. We're poised to do more. Uh, we're the CPAC team right now. We're implementing a deployable uh, Qualcomm that has all the tools and the materials necessary okay. that we could deploy to Darwin or deploy to, to, to the Philippines or wherever, to Guam to get a team out there to service that equipment. So that, that's, uh, you know, uh, again, CPAC program, it's, one, it's wild and wonderful. It's a, it's a service rather than acquisitions of a product. Right. Uh, but we provide that service, and it is very uh, rewarding when I get that, those results back from every, every in-brief and out-brief we do for every unit, every survey that we get back from the MAR4 Res team that gets out there saying, hey, thank you, CPAC, you're doing a great job. And, and that's, that's what it's all about. Listening to you reminds me of the old commercial for, I won't name the company, but the, their tagline in the commercial says, we don't make a lot of the things that you use, but we make a lot of the things that you use even better. Exactly. And that sounds like what your CPAC is doing. That, so. that CPAC. You know, corrosion, again, it's one of those things that's it's boring. Nobody wants to talk about it. It's very important. You, know, you, you could pay me a little bit now, or you're going to be paying a whole lot more later. And a lot of these programs are seeing uh, that, that, that suffrage now. So... Uh, let us take care of that now for the programs, and that's the message out to all the program managers. CPAC is here for you. Uh, let us take that engineering burden on, and guess what? It's not going to cost you a whole lot. If it gets into something that's really uh, substantial, then that, yeah, there may be a little bit of a fee, uh, but nothing compared to what you'll be paying later in those programs. Wow. Eric, hopefully a lot of the program managers and the logisticians are going to give you a holler after listening to this and say, come and help us. So. Exactly. Well, let me put it a little bit more in perspective for you. So DOD-wide, the annual uh, cost for corrosion is over $16 billion, okay? And the Marine Corps' part of that is for, for ground, just ground equipment is $454 million a year that they're having to pay for the consequences of corrosion. So we're trying to chip away at that cost. So if anybody out there in Marine Corps land or Marine Corps Systems Command land needs to track you guys down. Do you have a handy email address or a website? Uh, we've got a website. We've got a CPAC email box. Uh, it, 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 it's out there. We'll get that posted with the show notes. And so anybody that wants to contact you can uh, can hit up the website and the email address. Perfect. All right. So around here, we've got this thing called uh, the lightning round. We've got four lightning round questions. Are you ready to field the lightning round questions? Let's do it. Eric, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I've always wanted to be in the military. I went through different phases. I want to be an Army Ranger. I want to be a Navy SEAL. 
uh, Force Recon, and but I always I, I end up in the Marine Corps uh, because I want to be part of the the best fighting force the nation's got. So that's where I ended up. Excellent answer. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? King Tut. King Tut. That's a new answer on the show. So what? Why? Why King Tut? I'm just fascinated by by the Egyptian history, and and uh, you know we don't know much about him, but it's like hey. You know, if you're casting gold like that, there's got to be some kind of importance. And going far back as you can, I'd love to hear about the, the world as it was back in those days. And, you know, maybe you could tell me how the pyramids were built or whatever. We'd have some interesting conversations on some things. When we were kids, him and all of his stuff were doing, like, road shows around the U.S. Yeah, I remember when that first came out. I was fascinated yeah. by seeing the stuff in National Geographic. Right, absolutely. You know, and that, that's what, that's what uh, the first thing came to mind. So do you have any tips for maintaining a work-life balance? Yeah, so that's a good question. That, that's hard to do, but my, my suggestion and what I try to do is find yourself an extreme hobby uh, that you like to do that, that uh, differs than pushing buttons on a keyboard every day. Uh, I like to weld and uh, get into that mechanics, uh, fix motorcycles, and do some of those things that's, uh, that uh, get your mind off of, uh, that can put your mind in neutral, and so to say, and uh, do something radically different. Metal and fire. Nice. Metal and fire. Nice. What's a TV show, book, movie, or podcast that you'd recommend? So I just read a book, read a book, uh, Neptune's Inferno, uh, by James uh, Hornfisher. Very relevant books about the naval battles of Guadalcanal, okay. and uh, very relevant to today's uh, EABO uh, concept uh, in that book. Uh, so definitely a worthwhile read. It'll keep you on your toes uh, if you if you never read about any kind of naval battles during that time. It's very very interesting. All right. Well, Eric, uh, again, I've really enjoyed our our time uh, talking today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Well, this concludes another episode of Equipping the Corps. I hope you've enjoyed our conversation today. If so, please take a couple minutes to leave us a review, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Until next time, stay safe. This is Trip Elliott, signing off.